Hey, what's up, everybody? On this episode of the Bullpen Podcast, you're going to hear me and Ian Worrell get into some good conversation about what he has going on as the CEO of MyBit, how he got into cryptocurrency and blockchain, and then exactly what MyBit has coming up in the future. Let's do it. Oh, wait. One more thing before we get to the podcast. In this podcast, The Crypto Bully, any co-host and his guests do not give financial or investment advice and encourage you to do your own research on all topics mentioned. Do not invest into this market what you can't afford to lose. I bet I know what you're thinking. Is this really Morgan Freeman? Well, unfortunately not. But Lyndon thought it would be a good idea to use such a soothing voice for the legal mumbo-jumbo to smooth things over. Now, let's do it. Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Play ball! the bullpen podcast number nine the crypto bully wow (laughs) he makes it look so easy and that ball has left the stadium hey what's up everybody i want to welcome everyone to the seventh episode of the bullpen podcast powered by ecc Now, I'm your host, The Crypto Bully, also known as Mr. Crypto Carlton. And here on this podcast, I like to get into the bullpen with some of the most interesting and influential individuals in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space to pick their brains about their opinions and see what they have going on today. So today on the show, we have a very interesting individual. Happy to have this guy with us. He is actually the CEO, founder and CEO of MyBit. And seems like a, a pretty interesting guy. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest for today, Mr. Ian Worrell. How are you doing today, man? I am doing good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. No problem, man. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule, man, to come on to the show and uh, kind of talk back and forth, man. And I feel like uh, you have a lot of interesting stuff going on and, and stuff that people need to know about. So why don't you do this? For the people who may be unfamiliar with you, why don't you give them a little background and insight into, you know, a little bit of who you are and kind of how you got into the uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Sure. Um, So about six years ago, um, I stumbled across Bitcoin from some friends and just started like trading it and playing around with it. I had a background in finance. And then after like doing that for six months, I actually dove into the technology and really saw like blockchain and decentralization just really being like the next error for like mankind really and i don't really think that's an understatement i think it'll do exactly like what the dot-com boom did with like just changing everything in a very positive way and you know then from there i got more involved in the space started like learning how to code doing some stuff with like auditing and accounting software got big into like bitcoin mining in like 2013 did that for like a year and then really jumped onto ethereum so like right from like the pre-sale on and the white paper i was super sold on it and actually had like mock-ups for a decentralized like computing infrastructure like that myself, but had nowhere near the technical talent that Vitalik and Joseph and all of them had. And really ever since then, so for the past six years, I've just kind of devoted my entire life to the blockchain space. And even through all the ups and downs, just stuck with it and like just absolutely love the philosophy and everything behind it. Nice. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah, I did actually. I went back and took a look at uh, your LinkedIn, man. It seems like you have a pretty impressive resume, man. You've done a lot of CEO work, um, a lot of running of things. You obviously seem to have a really great hand in the crypto and blockchain space. Like, what do you feel? Do you feel like your past, the things that you've done in the past have helped you a lot in this space? And if so, in what ways has it helped you the most kind of break into this space? I think um, having like a a finance background definitely helps to just um, make it easier to break into the space because you're used to kind of alternative investments and volatility and stuff like that with different asset classes. But then really beyond that, it's really just anybody can do it. You just have to, it takes for anybody at least six months to a year of really doing a lot of research and understanding to actually fully grasp the potential. You see that in waves with the market cycle where, you know, like typically once every year or two, you'll have this giant bull run. 
And I think that's attributed to, you know, a lot of marketing in the previous year where people were introduced to the concept. And then maybe 20% of them actually really dove into learning more about it. And then six to eight months later, when they all finally clicked that this actually has potential to disrupt like business models all over the world, that's when you see just the money flow in like crazy. And you have that, um, you know, like bull runs like that. But really, like, I think anybody can do it if you just put in the time and you're really passionate about it. Right, right. Yeah, I could definitely agree with you. That's like a question I get all the time. People ask me, they're like, hey, you know, what, what do you feel like should be the first thing that I do? Or what do you think I should concentrate on when I first get into the space? And I'm like learning, I'm like education. You need to educate yourself. There's a lot when you talk about blockchain and cryptocurrency and there's so much you can learn. So like you said, that's what I did. I literally took about six to nine months and I literally ate, slept, drank blockchain and crypto. And I just studied as much as I can from the technical and non-technical side to really get a grasp on it. I mean, I guess it helped also me having a trading background a little bit myself, as well as kind of having a technical background as far as being a software QA analyst. But I mean, like you said, right, if you put in the work and the time and the effort, then I feel like it'll definitely end up coming back tenfold and uh, and help you on the journey into the, you know, crypto and blockchain space. So I can definitely agree with you there, man. So, and you said you did have a financial background. What was that uh, specifically? Uh, I was really just trading like derivatives and options and stuff. Not really. I'm pretty young, so I never did it like formally at an institution or anything, but I've been like trading um, equities and stuff for like a decade now. That's pretty awesome, man. So knowing that you have that background, that's kind of interesting. Now, do you see like a huge difference in trading, say, those form uh, those former derivatives versus like cryptocurrency? I really don't. So, you know, Bitcoin, obviously the market is pretty manipulated and you know, there's, you know, fake news, bots, market makers, like there's all sorts of things, especially with like the futures that got unwound in December. Like you're seeing a lot of manipulation, but that's existed since the earlier days. You're just seeing it on a higher level. You know, people used to have like a few thousand Bitcoin worth, you know, 10, 20 grand and manipulate markets. Now you actually need like institutional money to do it, but you're seeing that. But overall, I mean, I was kind of different when I would do trading and I did a lot based on um, psychology. So I never really looked at technical analysis too much. Like I'm familiar with it and know how to analyze it, but I would really look at more like sentiment analysis and just kind of like a game of chess. Like if I knew like this technical indicator was going to break, how are people going to react to that Um, and stuff like that? And I did that with equities and I've done that with crypto and it's actually pretty similar with that. You have a lot more volatility in the crypto industry, but that's just due to a lack of liquidity, I think. And, you know, people getting also just emotions because people are very scared because it's such a new thing that they don't really fully understand. So you have kind of weak hands a lot and that just leads to volatility. But you're also seeing the volatility like decrease pretty substantially year over year. Nice. Yeah, that's very true. And, uh, you know, you hear a lot about um, people that write, they take different uh, means as to how they trade when it comes to crypto, you know, whether they want to do it like day trading aspect, whether they want to do more of a long term huddle. Like generally when you trade crypto, what type of approach do you take to it? So I definitely have like investment positions that I've just never touched or not for the foreseeable future. But typically I do more of I think it's called like swing trade sort of, but kind of like extended ones. So kind of I don't do day trading or anything like that. And when I kind of just see a market trend where, you know, Bitcoin's either very like oversold or underbought, then I'll either just go long or short on that and hold it for anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. Really just do that minimum two or three times a year. Sometimes in the year, there's a few more opportunities. But I kind of like that because you don't have to, you know, when I first got started, I did a lot of day trading, a lot of leverage, a lot of stuff like that. And it just ate away at my life. It was very unhealthy in front of a computer like 22 hours a day and it just it wasn't really that sustainable and then i just learned over time that you can actually be more profitable with way less stress just by doing more of like the swing trade model i agree with you a hundred percent that is literally the exact the way that i kind of move the same in in the crypto space like i said i do some swing trading but generally i'll do more of a hodl kind of thing a long-term investment you know a year plus only because it does it eats away at a time i mean there's so many different things happening on i mean it's hard enough to keep up with just the news in blockchain and cryptocurrency but when you're talking about looking at a project or looking at a particular coin and trading that day trading that taking the time to do that and just sitting in front of a computer for so many hours in a day it's almost like you don't have time for anything else and I'm like, yeah. me, I like my personal time. I like spending time with my kids, my family, my girl, you know, going out, just doing stuff, watching a movie. So, yeah, I, f- I feel like a swing trading and a longer term trading is more of a good way for me to leverage my time, at least. So, yep. What's the point it. of making money if you don't have time to spend it and, you know, yep. enjoy it? Exactly. Exactly the point. It took me years to realize that, but I'm like slowly starting to grasp that concept. 
Yeah, that's the that's thing. I was like, all right, it's nice having, you know, if you have a million dollars in your bank account, but if you can't spend any of it, might kind of be pointless. So, <laughs> yeah, I could definitely agree with you there, man. So for somebody that's new, right, coming into the crypto space and they're wanting to trade it, what is the one thing that you would give them as advice? Don't listen to the media. Man, that is good <laughs> advice. That's super good advice, especially in this space. When you talk about the news, when you talk about Twitter and things like that, I mean, you talk about, you know, what do you feel like is the difference? So you have like the media advice versus the what a trader should actually do advice. Like, what do you feel a trader should do to get a really good grasp on like how to pull their news, where to get their information from when it comes to when it comes to crypto? Um, you really need to surround yourself in groups of people that have been in the industry for a while and they can help guide you on like what to filter and what not to. And then, at least for me, like I don't really have time to like, read the news and stay up to date with everything every day. So I just surround myself pe- with people that will be able to fill me in on the really important things in pretty much real time. So that is just a very like efficient way, at least for me to do that. And I would say, you know, the media really, I take what they're saying sometimes. Like I'll always check in every once in a while just to get like sentiment of the whole market. But when, you know, they're saying to buy and all your friends are buying and everything like that, sell to them. Because that's when you're basically entering that last stage of euphoria before the next cycle begins. And after you hear about hacks and regulation and all sorts of stuff like that, you know, we've seen it year over year where all of that is used just to push the price down to scare people, get the weak hands out so that the big holders can just accumulate more. Um, So you just really need to take emotion out of the picture and understand the cycles. And, you know, the first year you're probably lose money because the market is like the wild west but as long as you log log all your trades and be like pretty diligent on you know what why did i make this decision what was going on in the media what sources what what basically made me make that decision then by year two you should be able to really crush it i think the biggest help that i had when i first got into this was that i had a friend who had been in it for already for about two and a half years and man, the fact that he was able to tell me to where to go to look for for good information, where to you know where not to go to to get information, like to me that was the biggest help. Because without that, I mean, there's just so much out there, and honestly, so much BS that it it can almost be hard to figure out okay what's real and what's not, what what's good information and what's bad information. So yeah, I definitely think when you have that guide, when you surround yourself in a circle of people who've been in it and kind of know what direction to go to for information, that completely changes the world, your world of cryptocurrency. And it makes it a lot easier to move around, right? Because you don't have to necessarily worry. I feel like you get a more realistic view of what this space actually is and what it has to offer versus, you know, a person that kind of jumps in by themselves and doesn't have any kind of direction at all because it is, it's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, you have Reddit, you have Twitter, you have Discord, you have Telegram, you have all of these different groups, Facebook. I mean, there's so much going on and there's so many different people giving different information. It's like, okay, who do I actually listen to? Who's going to help me? I think an important part too is just understanding the projects you're investing in. So I personally yes. have a philosophy where I will only trade projects that I'm not afraid to bag hold. So if you know they completely implode, I look at it as an investment too. Like I'll do trading so I can keep increasing my investment in them without like having to allocate more money. At right. least in theory, that's what I try to do. You know, there's like certain coins, you know, typically I follow like the 80 20 rule, but I think that in this industry, I don't even think 20% of the projects are good. I think there's way too much overhype and not really enough tech being built. So I'd say, like, really, if you're going to get into trading, it's not purely financial. You have to look at it and just understand the basics of the technology and be able to almost invest and trade like a venture capitalist where you can at least analyze the team a little bit, analyze the business model, make sure the tech's built. Obviously, most like you can't do that all yourself. So just surround yourself with people where you can get feedback from. And then that way you take emotion out of the picture. So if you invest in something like, you know, Enigma is a project I love, even when they go down and you're on the wrong side of a trade, you're still like, long term, I don't care because that's a really good project I think has a really good future. Yeah, I could definitely agree with you there too. Yeah, when I first got in, um, and that's kind of what I tell people a lot all the time too, is that I only want to trade projects and really get involved in them if I really believe in what they're doing. And I feel like there, there is a long term potential because I feel like if you don't, you know, it's like the risk, the risk versus reward, risk reward ratio can be a little skewed and it can end up, it could potentially end up being bad. And I'm like, 
My thing is that I want to be exposed to as little risk as possible, but with as much upside potential as possible at the same time, too. So I feel like, you know, going through the, the fundamental aspects and really digging in, seeing, OK, who's a part of the team? What are they doing technologically? You know, what are they trying to do? Is it, you know, that's different from everybody else? Are they tapping into an industry that, you know, isn't really being acknowledged right now in the space? And kind of really figure out like, okay, where, are, where is their place? That part, this particular project space in the whole cryptocurrency world. And yeah, I feel like that's a really good way to go. I know I do that myself. A lot of people that I talk to, a lot of knowledgeable people, people like yourself that I talk to that have a lot of experience, they, they all pretty much say the same thing. So I, I really think that's a good route to go. I mean, you know, I, I run into so many people, honestly, that trade like 15 coins and some of the coins, they literally um, know almost nothing about it. And I'm just like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. Like I would be up worrying, like what the hell is going to happen to my, my money if something goes down, you know? So yeah, me, I, I keep it pretty simple and I definitely go that route as well. Exactly. I mean, that's pure gambling when you do that. Investing yep. and trading is still like a form of gambling in my eyes, but you can at least like calculate it a lot more. And it's almost like you're counting cards yep. versus just going on a roulette table and just praying. Yeah. No joke. Yeah. A lot of people are, seems like, oh, at least a lot of people, it seems like a lot of people are playing, uh, roulette with crypto right now. But, you know, in time, I have faith that, you know, hopefully people become a lot more knowledgeable and, you know, things will become a lot more apparent and that it'll become less about the money overall, I guess, and more about the technology, but in a healthy way. I mean, obviously people are going to want to make money. Everybody wants to make money. I know I want to make money, but, you know, at the same time, it's like you want to make smart investment decisions. You don't want to just start kind of, like you said, emotionally making decisions and putting yourself exposed to a lot of risk. Because then it could just become not fun really fast. Or like projects you believe in. Because then even at night, you're just happy. Even if you're at a loss, you're like, you know, I can make it through this. I really believe in the project, the vision, everything like that. So I think that's an important aspect just to mitigate a lot of the stress with it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No joke. And honestly, speaking of projects that we believe in, man, my bit. I took a look at that. I'm impressed. <laughs> like, uh, it's pretty, that's pretty awesome, man. It, it really is a pretty awesome project, man. Why don't you go ahead and give uh, the listeners, man, a little rundown on exactly what my bit is and uh, your vision for it. Thanks for the kind words. I mean, we still have a long way to go, but I think we're in the right direction right now. So essentially how my bit came to be is about like, Two years ago. So, I mean, as I said earlier, my background's in like um, trading and I always look at like alternative assets and stuff like that. And I really got intrigued by like AI automation and like machinery that was just going to um, make jobs pretty much redundant. I like saw that as a massive opportunity, did a lot of research and there's um, like Forbes and stuff was projecting it's going to be like a $10 trillion market by 2025 off like machines and IoT devices generating revenue instead of the human workforce. Right. And then I like, I came to a realization where, you know, you have all of, I didn't want to see the world go in a way where you have all of these people that lost their jobs due to automation. And then all of these machines are owned by a select few like banks or private funds. And, you know, then you just have these people without income coming in, spending money to, you know, the few groups that own all the machinery. And you get this like crazy income disparity where we're already heading in the wrong direction. And I think that would just exacerbate it. So we saw with my bid, it was just a really, you know, we saw a perfect match for Ethereum smart contracts where you could basically just automate the whole investment function for like hedge funds and typically um, funds that would go into alternative assets. So for those that don't know like too much about how investments like that, if you wanted to get into something that's non-traditional, that's not like a publicly traded company or like a really known startup, you wanted to get into like a solar farm somewhere or a fleet of like self-driving cars or drones or like something like that. You would typically have to give your money to a fund that specializes in those sorts of investments. Yeah. And that was against all the principles that I follow with like Bitcoin, where, you know, having somebody else control your money, I'm not into that, paying fees just for having them move it around. It's not transparent. It's not real time. And the fees are ridiculous on like hedge funds. It's typically like a two and 20 or three and 30. So you basically have to pay 20 or 30% of your profits to them. And they take two or three percent of your initial capital up front. Yeah. And that it model just made no sense to me because it's just it's not efficient. And at least for me, where I like managing my own investments, if they kind of have the market cornered where you're unable to do that. Then another big aspect of it too is there's a huge um, barrier to entry with that because you typically have to be an accredited investor, right. which means you have a million dollars, not even net worth, but like liquid in cash, not real estate. Like very, very few people have that. Right. Or you have to make 250000 a year as like a single person. And that's just not fair to allow 
the 98% of the world, 99% that can't afford to do that, they would be like closed off from this economy. So we just found a pretty simple way where we use smart contracts to automate that, where we plug in directly into the IoT devices through oracles and are going to start playing around with Slocket's IoT layer just so we bypass that middleman. So you don't have to give your money to a fund and all of that. You directly invest in a type of revenue generating asset, which could be solar panels, cars, Bitcoin ATMs, miners, like really everything's going towards automation. We're even like testing Slocket with how we can do it for like um, some real estate, like co-working spaces and storage units. Like there's really limitless possibilities with it. But it was just, uh, you know, you're always in charge and in control of your investment. You can liquidate it at any time on a decentralized exchange we're building. You get paid out in real time. So like as that asset generates revenue, you're getting it distributed right to your wallet. You don't have to wait like quarterly or annually for a fund to send you a wire transfer. So, I mean, it, and it was a pretty simple implementation. You know, we're pretty slow to market with it, but it's because we're focusing a ton on the front end and the user experience, the user interface, because so many blockchain applications are impossible to use, even yep. for me. And I know my way around the industry very well. Um, so we've put a ton of time and money into that, but we'll be releasing like our alpha um, within the next few months. And, you know, that's, that's kind of a very long winded answer to your question and a little background of like where we are. Yeah, man. I love every part of what you just said, though. Like that is amazing to me because like you said, right, it's not necessarily fair, right? That only people that meet that accredited investing standard on, they're the only ones that have access to higher quality investments and stuff. And I feel like you're taking that and completely turning it upside down and you're making it something that anybody can have access to and that could, you know, could basically potentially invest if they want to. And then on top of that, a really key a component that you spoke on is, like you said, the UI and the user experience, right? And you understand how important that is and how much that is, you know, lacking in this space right now. So when you combine those things, I think the potential of my bit is ridiculous. Like I could see that being so awesome and helpful and opening up doors for so many different people across the world, you know, to give a person a system, a place where they can go and, you know, make great investment decisions. And then another important aspect that you said that I highly believe in is having control of your own money. Basically, you being the vehicle that drives whatever you want to do. I feel like those are all of the most important aspects of when you get into investing. So it's like you're literally taking all of that, taking the current crypto ecosystem as it exists, and then basically creating that full experience for a specific investor, for a person that wants to invest. And I think that's a beautiful one, not to mention, obviously, like you said, you have the D aspect of it, and then you also have the decentralized exchange aspect of it. You know, it really is going to be almost like a one-stop shop, man. And I feel like you are absolutely putting your time, energy, and money into where things should go in a project. Like, I feel like when I looked at this and really looked at this, I was like, oh shit, like this is, this is really awesome. Like this is, this is amazing, you know, and I cannot wait to see where this goes in the future. You know, if anybody has not looked at you guys's video that talks about what you guys are doing, they need to watch that. That's important. So I, I really do think that's awesome, man. I think it's amazing. I think it's going to catch a lot of people off guard, but in a really good way. So what exactly, like my bet, what, what exactly do you guys, where are you at right now with what you're doing? Like, what are you, what are you working on and what is your, your like near future goals? Yeah. So we're releasing our private alpha to about a hundred people that we've pre-selected in about two weeks, like the first week of August. Mm -hmm. And then the plan is in September to open that up publicly. And let people start playing around. It'll still be on testnet at that time. In October, we're going to DevCon and doing an event with Status and Omisago and a few other companies um, where we're going to unveil something like pretty massive. Right. And then um, by the end of the year, we should be in a public beta. And still be determined if that's going to be on testnet or if we're going to be able to move it over to mainnet. There's a lot of variables that we're still determining with that from a regulation standpoint, but also from Ethereum migrating to Casper and proof of stake. Um, we don't want to like jump the gun too soon on it. But basically, you know, we've spent the past year really developing the building blocks to everything. And we're just starting to actually market the idea. We saw in the industry, there was too much marketing and nothing being built. Yeah. So we wanted to flip that and actually develop something before we really started marketing it. So over the next few months, we'll actually start pulling that all together and having it all go out. And it should be really exciting. 
That's awesome, man. That's yeah, that's a beautiful thing. I can't wait to start seeing that come together because it is in this space. I feel like there is there's over marketing and lack of development or not anything there to back up the degree of marketing that a lot of these these projects are using. So to have, you know, a project like yours that's really taking and putting a lot of their energy into the development of the actual product and the services and everything. And then, you know, taking that and then pushing out the marketing. I feel like that's a good thing. I feel like that's good for the space overall. I hope to honestly start seeing a lot more of that. And it's, it does. It seemed like you and, and your team, it seemed like you guys are really addressing everything. Like, I'm, you know, I'm literally sitting here thinking about like, What's something that I could think of that I feel like you guys may have missed? And I really can't think of anything, man. And that's awesome. That's good to to have that thought when I'm thinking about a particular project. Oh, specifically, actually, because with the direction you're going in, right? Have you ran into anything that could potentially be like a a legal problem when you think about, you know, creating this this ecosystem for people to use and things like that? Like what things have you had to push through on the legal side to make sure all your I's are dotted and T's are crossed? So we've never really run into any legal issues directly. We've been pretty proactive where we're like planning ahead for things. You know, we've definitely had some scares when we thought the SEC was going to come out and call Ethereum a security and, um, you know, different things with exchanges, having to disclose information and KYC issues with token sales, like, you know, stuff like that. We've been very scared about, but we've done a pretty good job of like being proactive as much as we can. You know, I'm a pretty big believer that innovation drives regulation. So as long as you're not doing something gross, grossly like illegal and fraudulent, as long as you're trying your best, you can't really let regulation slow you down too much. And you just have to be ready to like adopt it when something gets pushed through. But regulation is so slow and so yeah. opaque that you know it's really hard to follow, um, especially in like certain countries. You just can't really do it because they don't have an open door policy. You know, Switzerland's fantastic because if you have any issues, you can go right into the regulators and they'll give you a decision. It might be a slow process, but they'll like work with you. But I mean, that's really it. Um, you know, you know, a few things we know we're going to have to deal with it that could just um, slow down the mainnet transmission or transition a few months. Um, would just be different countries have different investment laws. Right. So we just have to find the right partner to do KYC. You know. Can you invest a thousand euros without having to put in your ID if you're from this country? Right. You know, it differs with that, which isn't really a regulatory barrier per se. It's more of just uh, slowing down the process. But overall, um, I think regulation is really just to like frighten people. I, you know, even the SEC, to um, my surprise, has actually been pretty good. Knock on wood. Yeah. <laughs> about just going after pure cases of fraud. And they really, I was kind of worried for a little, they were going to start stifling innovation and really just going after the industry a lot. But it, I mean, it seems so far like everybody's pretty embracing of it. Probably has a lot to do with banks having massive holdings and lobbying right. in that direction. But I mean, it's benefiting us. So that's yeah. really it from that regard. Something to, you know, we don't really we're really surprised we don't really have any competitors within the blockchain space because it, it's a pretty simple concept with what we're building. And right. I mean, it really just seems to make sense to use blockchain to decentralize it. It has a business model. It has a market for it. And really, our competitors are mainstream hedge funds. And you know they have the advantage of having existing deal flow, existing client relationships, stuff like that. But what's important to note with us is like we're really just creating the toolkit for a free economy and a free market. So you're going to have, you know, right now, if you want to do self-directed investments, you can't. You have to go through a hedge fund for these alternative investments. But we still think we're going to have a majority of the hedge funds in the world slowly adopt onto our platform because it just makes their back office more efficient. You know, they can keep charging their clients the two and 20, but their overhead expenses will go down the drain because you know, we just create a more assist, uh, efficient system to manage their back office. So we don't think it's really just going to be like individuals using it. We think we'll actually start getting a lot more of like the innovative hedge funds to start testing out, actually moving over their investments onto this, which would be, you know, very cool. And that'll all be done behind the scenes. They'll never disclose that to their clients because then their clients would be like, why don't you reduce my fees? But uh, <laughs> yeah. we think we're not really going after them. Like some people think where we're going to take down hedge funds, we're creating a better back office solution for them, which they can plug into. So it's really beneficial in that regard. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you're giving, I feel like what cryptocurrency is about, you're giving people options. They have the option to where they want to go with a traditional hedge fund or they want to use your, 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 um, your D app and your DAX and your services and things like that. And I think that's the awesome part about it. Like I said, you know, I feel like with cryptocurrency, right, there's always 
there's, you know, such thing as, you know, uh, healthy competition. And I feel like that you guys really embody that, that you're like, hey, we're creating this not to completely eliminate somebody else, but we're going to take what we see is a, you know, disadvantage in this market and create something that gives other people options. And that's what I really love about my bit. I like that. Um, I like that a lot, actually. If I'm correct, you guys are located in Switzerland, correct? Yeah, right okay. in Sug, which is like 20 minutes from Zurich. Nice, very nice. So was that was that done purposely? Was that just it just happened to be where where you were at or where you wanted to go, or what, what was the the reason behind that that move? Um, it kind of happened where we were following Ethereum here, just because it's a really good just business environment. Yeah. And then um, after just traveling here a few times over the course of a year, like two years ago, I fell in love with it and just decided to move here. And then um, our CTO was actually living here. I'm working for a fintech startup Mm -hmm. and kind of just so we have some of the team here and then the rest of them are like all over, you know, Europe. But we typically have like our monthly team meetings and everything in Switzerland and it kind of just happened to fell into place. It's a beautiful country. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, definitely a place I want to visit in the future. Switzerland seems amazing. It definitely seems to be a place where a lot of cryptocurrency innovations are happening. A lot of seems like a lot of teams are locating themselves there and it, it just seems it makes sense it just makes sense in the in the world we're in right now with the way everything works it definitely seems like a good place to be so yes yeah, definitely a place i want to come check out another question i wanted to ask you uh ian when it comes to your team the people that you work alongside in order to make my bit possible in order to you know push this and develop it what is that like what is your team like what all do you guys what kind of team do you have what are you guys working on we're family. We are like super passionate, super close together. I think what really like stands us out is really nobody's in it purely for the money. Everybody really believes in the vision. We initially, like a year ago when we just raised our funding, like had a pretty high turnover rate because we, you know, we really wanted to stick with people who were passionate about our vision and could really like fit in with the family. Right. But like now it's, I mean, it's, it's a really, really close knit team and we work very, very well together. And it's like, I, I couldn't be happier. It's the cat's off to them. That's, that's pretty awesome, man. Yeah, definitely. I know, I know, know a few people on your team, man, and, and they are, they have that passion. And I, I love that, man. I love people who obviously they want to make money, right? But they're not in it just solely for that. And I feel like that brings a whole nother level of innovation to a particular project. So when you have people who are joined together, who are all trying to further themselves and further the space as a whole, rather than just thinking about money, the type of things that can be created from that is, it, it, I mean, it can be, you know, crazy in, in the best way possible. And I feel like that, yeah, I feel like my bit has a lot of greater potential and a lot of great things to come. I'm not going to lie. It's not many projects that I look at and I get the feels <laughs> when I when I look into them and really look at, you know, the pieces they have put together and the direction they're moving in. But I really feel like my bit is definitely doing a really great job in what they're trying to create. And you guys are really open about that. I feel like it's, I don't have to worry. I don't feel like, okay, can I really believe what this Ian guy is telling me? Like, no, I feel like, I, I feel like I can. I feel like, you know what you're talking about. You're genuine about what you're talking about. And you do, you have a clear vision for the project. And that makes me happy. You know, that makes me happy when I hear and talk to individuals like you, like yourself and see projects that exist like this. Like, you know, I'm, I'm hundred percent interested, man. And I definitely want to do a lot of more research into it myself. I want to encourage others to do more research into it, you know, for everybody, please. I mean, take a chance, go, go to their website. It's my bit, M Y B I T dot I O. When you get to the website, click on the play video button to the right. <laughs> I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. I definitely wasn't. Yeah, man, I'm, hats, hats off to you, honestly, for, for taking the knowledge that you had in the past, all of your experience, your knowledge in crypto and creating something like this, man. I think this, this is something that the world needs. I think this is, this is going to help a lot of people. And like you said, it's even more exciting when you think about the, the larger hedge entities that could also use this to, you know, help further their own, you know, their own agenda and things like that. So, I mean, this, this is an awesome project. Definitely. Cool. I really appreciate the kind words. Yeah, yeah. No problem at all, man. One thing, one other thing I like to ask all my guests that come on the show. Now, for you yourself, what do you want to be your staple? What what kind of legacy do you want to leave when it comes to yourself in terms of blockchain and cryptocurrency? Oh, I want to do something that like makes a difference. You know, like I just don't, I don't really care too much about the money. You know, I really enjoy my freedom and that's what money brings to me. But I really want to do something that has a lasting impact that actually like disrupts 
a business model and stuff yeah. like that. You know, like where we may see that with Bitcoin, you know, early holders of Bitcoin got rich, but we haven't really seen it penetrate mainstream and really like disrupt banks or anything yet. Right. But I think, I mean, it still has potential to do that, but I think there will be a few projects that actually disrupt the world for like a better thing. Cause you know, don't really like the direction the world's going in as a whole and right. just doing something that, you know, we're not going to solve all the problems in the world, but just slowly just help out something with that and actually do like a lasting use case that actually helps some people somewhere. I can agree with that. And yeah, man, that's, that's a great answer. And I think my bit is definitely going to be that, honestly. So yeah, man, again, highly appreciate you, man, taking time out of your busy day. I know you have a lot of stuff going on, especially with my bit to come on the show, man, and, and talk to me and, and, you know, talk to the listeners about everything that you have going on. I have to have you back on the show in the future. Um, if you'd like to come on and yeah, get some more updates on what's going on with my bit, man. I think you guys are going to have a lot of interesting things coming. And I look forward to seeing, man. That's how you guys advance and where you guys go with all of it. Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right, Ian. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. And uh, you have a good day. All right. You too. We'd like to thank everyone for your support here at the Bullpen Podcast all season long and look forward to having you at the next episode. We'd also like to give a special thanks to the team behind the scenes that make this show possible. Today's show notes can be found on our website at thebullpenpodcast.io forward slash post show stats. Also, don't forget to like and retweet us at one bullpen podcast. That's the number one bullpen podcast. And to watch Lyndon do some exciting and probably some weird things too, tune into the Snapchat at the Crypto Bully. That's at the Crypto Bully. It's been a pleasure, and see you at the next show. Good night, everyone.